الله عليه الصالحين وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى today we're going to cover uh, several points starting with the essence of salat I mean, what is salat all about is it just external submission or is there more to the salat than, than the movements the second topic we're going to cover is one of the wisdom, wisdoms behind the salat is that when you feel worried and you feel sad, you have to recognize what the reason for that feeling is. And it's being distanced from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the salat is a way to, to bridge the gap, right? It's to take away that distance that's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, then Ibn al-Qayyim is going to go directly into each aspect of salat and why it's important for the completeness of servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show you how the salat is a comprehensive act of worship. And so from laying that out, he's going to go into wudu. Then he's going to talk about coming to the masjid. And then he's going to talk about the takbir, takbir al ihram. Then he's going to talk about the istiftah, and the dua that you make at the very beginning of your salat before you start reciting fatiha. Then he's going to talk about isti'adah and so on and so forth. And so today, we're actually going to get into the meat of the treaties, inshallah ta'ala. And we are on page 25, is that what it is? Yeah. 1.6, page 25. Before we get into this, it's important to know how we got here. And it, it is critical that you have the book with you, either a physical copy or a PDF, because you have to follow along. The whole point of studying a book is actually also to learn how to read. Uh, learning how to read is not just that you know the words, or you know what the words mean, or you know what the sentence mean. It's figuring out what is the relationship between this paragraph and the paragraph that comes after. How do these things relate? Why is the author saying what he's saying? You have to, because this is what it means to actually develop literacy. So that you can open up a book at some point after you've studied you know, enough times that you're now able to follow that same process by yourself. All right? And it doesn't mean you're going to understand everything, but it means you know how to look out for what is this book, what is the author actually trying to tell me. And that's part of this, the reason why we actually just read books and not just come and just do lectures. It's to, to learn how to read, which is super important for us to do. So last week... Uh, we ended up talking about uh, the three different types of people. Ibn Qayyim, rahmatullahi alayhi, he says that people are of three types in general. Number one was what? The one with the good farmland. The one with the good farmland. <laughs> How did he describe that person? What did he say about that person? Huh? Uses his limbs for the sake of Allah. Uses his limbs. That, that person? Huh? Diligent. So all of these, are th all of these come under the, huh? Say it again. He's cautious. Very cautious. Oh, yeah, cautious. Same. Something else. Mindful. mindful. Who said it? MashaAllah. Zakallah khair. Right? This person is the mindful person. And uh, he mentions several things under there. Like you said, the, the good land and tilling the land and he's cautious and so on and so forth. But there's three main things that make a person mindful. I mean, this is the to, to summarize what Ibn al-Qayyim says. So you need, you need to know this. Now you can go back wherever it is in a book and you can just write this on the side. Being mindful, first of all, is that you recognize Allah's favor. That's, that's the first thing. You recognize that he's giving you a gift. Right? The, the second part is that you utilize the gift to please the gifter. Right? So that gift that Allah gave you you're using that gift to please him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the third thing is that you protect the gift, all right? That you protect it. So he gave the example of making sure that you're weeding it, right? Making sure that nothing else is messing up your crops. And that you also set up guards, right? He said you, you'll even hire some guards to set up the gates to protect it, right? And to make sure that nothing else and is going to come and uh, destroy that favor that, that you have. Tell you. The second type of person is? Heedless. Let's, let's start. 
Uh, so th this person he called treacherous <coughs> because what, what's treachery you mean? Okay, so betrayal is the, is the word you think of when you think of treachery. That person betrayed a particular trust that they had. So, so they proved treacherous, right? And, and when we think about why this person is treacherous, they use the favors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them to disobey Allah azza wa right? And we talked about something under that, which is that not everything that is... Not everything that is beneficial is halal. And not everything that is haram is totally harmful. And that's why the person who is treacherous misuses the favors of Allah. Sometimes they may misuse that favor, but it's beneficial to other people. It's harming themselves because they learned so that people could say they were a scholar. But them teaching is still beneficial to the people that are, that are learning from them. Right? So that's treachery, in fact. That, that's treachery, right? A, a person who, for example, they get their earnings from Rebet, right? But then they give to the poor. Do the poor benefit from that? Absolutely. Is what he's doing halal? No, it's, it's haram to, take, to get your earnings from Rebet. But this is how he's, he's now giving sadaqah based on it. So not everything that is haram is totally harmful. Right? And that's an important point, that's an important concept to understand. Just like not everything that is beneficial is, is halal. So somebody might say, listen, on Friday night, I need that shot. Like, I, I need that to calm down. Like, uh, nerves. Uh, and it might, for them, for them, it may have some benefit in it. And a lot of y'all talked about that in the Quran. It's still haram. It's still haram. And sometimes this is, this is a problem people have to overcome because they're putting their intellect above above the text. I don't understand why this is like halal or this is we have to do this. So I don't understand this and this is eh, because I mean, you're not Rabbul Alameen and you're not going to know everything. And that's fine. It's like you can't see everything. You have some sight, but you can't see everything. You have ears and, and, and ability to hear, but you can't hear everything. And you have a mind, mashallah, an ability to ration. But that doesn't mean you can understand everything. So know your place and don't go against Rabbul Alameen. So that's the, that's the second type, the treacherous. The third type of person is heedless. And why did Ibn Qayyim say that that one is even worse than the treacherous person is the worst of the three categories? Because that person is useless. They don't bring anything to the dunya and doing nothing for their hereafter. So now we move into what Ibn Qayyim says is the secret and the essence of salah. Now, Fadda. Page 25, page 25. Uh, so reading from page uh, 25, uh, the uh, 1.6, the secret and essence of Salah. The secret and essence of Salah lies in the inclination of the heart towards Allah alone and focusing attention on Him while praying. All right, so this is what you write on the side or you write some. The essence of Salah it boils down to two things. And this is super important for us, subhanAllah, because the reality is, is that a lot of people, when we learn how to pray, right, either by watching your parents pray or you accepted Islam so somebody taught you how to pray, everything focuses on what? Movement. Anyway, first, face the Qibla. Say Allahu Akbar. Huh? Don't worry about the dua. You can learn that later. Huh? <laughs> Say Surah Al-Fatiha. We're not even talking about what this Fatiha actually means. Right, and then you got to make rukur, and then and so you just learning what movement. Subhanallah. Did we ever go back and actually try to think about? Wait a minute. Why do we start standing and not in prostration? Why do we go into rukur before we go into sujud? Like what's and just start thinking. Why Allahu Akbar? Allah has ninety nine names. Mi'atun illa wahida. Right, and He has more than that. But the, the point is, like, why Akbar? Why not Allahu A'lam? Right? So, like, actually trying to figure out, what is this prayer? What is this supposed to actually be doing for me? And, and it's interesting because there's not, there aren't many other things that we do in a day more than Salah. 
right? Like even meals. How many meals a day? Three. I mean, if you're eating five squares, that's, that's probably a problem, right? The three meals. So when you're young, you just eat, right? Because cause you're young. As you get older, what do you start doing? It's not just that you're eating less. You start, huh? You start considering what you eat. Wait a minute. Okay, these are vegetables. I need, need half my plate needs to be green, right? And then I need some protein. And then, and then if you really get into it, you might start measuring stuff, right? Because you start realizing that it's not just about eating anything. You actually need to consider what it is that you're putting in your body because that's your fuel and it's important. Like, do we, Again, do we stop to think about what is this salat actually supposed to be doing? Because the food is supposed to do something for you. And if it doesn't do it for you, right, if you're just eating mindless food and it's not even making you full, and after a while you start realizing, like, what am I doing eating that for, right? Or if you eat something that makes you sick, you're like, I can't do that again. You might eat something to have an allergic reaction to it. You know you can't eat that again. So you monitor that. And the reason, the reason why it's important to us is because we need food to, to live. And Eliza would done likewise for our hearts to be alive. We have to pray. It's, it's, it is absolutely necessary for our souls, right? But understanding what that salat is supposed to be doing and working through it, that's, that's what this book is about. So the first thing, when, when we look at the essence of Salat, what is this Salat all about? It is about the, number one, the heart turning to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is, you are totally devoted to Allah in Salat. And I know this is just, this is all cognitive and theoretical at this point. It's just, okay, yeah, okay, the heart turns. But knowing is important to, it's the, it's the step that you need before doing. So knowing what it's supposed to look like. And, and as we say, easier said than, than done. But if you don't even know to aspire to something, if you don't even know that that's what Salat is about, then how do you, how do you get there? Uh, as I was teaching a class over the weekend, uh, Usul al-Sunnah by Al-Humaydi, Abdullah ibn Zubair, rahimahullah ta'ala. So he, he has a small book on Aqidah called Usul al-Sunnah. First hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, right, uh, is what? Anybody know what the first hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari is? In the mal'amal bin niyat Bukhari, at the very beginning of his Sahih, he says, Haddathana al-Humaydi, Abdullah ibn al-Zubayr. Qala haddathana sufyan yani ibn Uyayna. So in the very beginning of Sahih al-Bukhari, his first hadith is, he's taken from his sheikh, Abdullah ibn al-Zubayr, al-Humaydi, right, who wrote Surah Sunnah, Book on Aqidah. So, but before I ask the students to, uh, to open up Sahih Bukhari, I just said, does anybody, anybody memorize Sahih Bukhari from the beginning? And somebody said, people memorize Sahih Bukhari? And I said, it's still people right now, kids. They memorize all the Kutub al-Sitta in their teens, right? So after they've memorized the Quran. I'm talking about six books. They memorize Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, Tarmidhi, Nasai, Ibn Majid, with the Isnad. With this snack. And so somebody was like, I mean, you could see him like, wait a minute. They didn't even know that was a thing, right? How do you aspire if you don't even know that that's a thing, right? So I'm, I'm saying, to, <laughs> I'm saying with the Salah, it's the same thing. You even, you have to know first what this is about. And then you can aspire actually to get there and, and seek Allah's aid in getting there. And that's, again, that's what this class is about, inshallah. I mean, we're trying to help each other get there. The second thing, the second thing, uh, Ibn al-Qayyim, rahmatullahi alayhi, he uses the word hudur al-qalb, right? So the presence of the heart. In other words, complete presence, undivided attention, full focus. All right? What did I just say? Complete presence, undivided attention, fully focused, fully focused. This is what Ibn al-Qayyim, rahmatullahi is trying to get. Number one, you turn your heart to Allah, and you are present, absolutely present, completely in the moment, as they say, right? A lot of, uh, 
the, the, because mental health terminology is spread out now, they talk about being present. Huh? You hear people talk about that in relationships. Being present. All right. I mean, I don't necessarily I don't ascribe to all of that, but I mean, you get the point, right? Being present in this moment is critical. Play it. Mesh. Go ahead. Read the second sentence. Consider, Consider the case of a person whose heart is engaged in one's own thoughts and worldly affairs. He is like a person who visits the king and, and intending to apologize for his own mistakes and shortcomings, beseeching rain from the clouds of his, gut, of his generosity and mercy to nourish his heart enough so it can be at his, it can be at his service. However, as soon as he arrives at his, at his doorstep and is on the verge of calling upon him, he turns away from the king and instead starts to busy himself with things that are most disliked and disparaged by the king. Even as his heart is inclined towards trivial matters, he still stands <coughs> forth, he sta still he sends. Still sends forth his servants, i.e. limbs, to serve him on his behalf and to excuse and compensate for the absence of his heart. All right, stop right there, stop right there. All right, so you got to be able to break this stuff down, right? What, what example is he giving us? He's, he's talking about the person who's, who doesn't do number one and two. So no, number one and two is what? That the heart is? The heart turns to Allah. You are faith, which, is, which is part of the hikmah of facing a qibla. Okay? You, you have to have a direction to face. So your heart turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you're completely in the moment. All right. So he says the one that is not like that. Okay? In other words, the one who is not focused, is preoccupied with his own thoughts. Okay? He's like the one who's going to the king. Now, you think about any, any of the subjects, it's, it's an honor to be able to have an audience with the king, right? And so this person is going to the king. He's made some mistakes. He messed up. And he's saying, let me go to the king before, before the king sends the soldiers to, to me. I'm just going to go. I'm going to throw myself at his mercy, apologize, right? And so he's going to the king. He wants an audience with the king. And he wants to, he wants to apologize, he wants to beseech his mercy, right? And then he also wants to get something from the king. So, because he said, look, I, I just want, I want to serve you better, but like I need to eat good, right? So he says to the king, like, and I need something to help nourish me as well. Okay, so now, just as he's about to go in, right? They, so you, you don't just walk up to the king. You got to, you know, you go through a few stages before you get to the king. So just as he's about to get in to talk to the king, he started looking right, left. This is how Ibn Al-Qaim describes it. I know it didn't translate exactly that way, but in the Arabic, this is what he's saying. So he's saying he's turning right and left. Might even just turn around and he's preoccupied. So he has his own, uh, like, uh, servants. The, this, this one who's going to see the king. He's got his own, uh, you know, servants. So instead of him going inside to talk to the king, he sends his servants in. So I'm, I'm a little too busy to talk to the king, basically. I'm preoccupied with some other stuff. I got stuff going on here and there, right? And he sends his servants in. This is, this is what Ibn al I want you to get the, get the picture. So go back and read this. Read, read it again. Okay. Consider the case of a person. Consider the case of a person whose heart is engaged in one's own thoughts and worldly affairs. He is like a person who visits the king, in, king intending to apologize for his own mistakes and shortcomings, beseeching rain from the clouds of his generosity and mercy to nourish his heart enough so it can be at his service. However, as soon as he arrives at his, his doorstep, it is on the verge of calling upon him. He turns away from the king and instead starts to busy himself with things that are most disliked and disparaged by the king. Even, All right, we, we, we got that? You understand what I'm saying? So even? Even as his heart is inclined towards trivial matters, he still sends forth his servants, i.e. his limbs, to serve him on his behalf and to excuse and compensate for the absence of his heart. So in other words, it, it, now he's, he's making that, he's giving you that example, huh? So, so now he said, basically it's like now my, 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 my hands are going to move, they're going to go up, my tongue is going to move, uh, I'm going to, but the heart is not there, right? And so this is like, it's like he's sending the, the servants in to, to talk to the king, right? But he's, Basically say I'm a little too busy to talk to the king myself. Mm. Despite but, that. But despite that, the, the generosity and the benevolence of the king 
refuses to, dis to dismiss his, the servant of his, of his slaves, of his slaves without granting their master, i.e. the slaves of Allah, a portion of his mercy. In other words, the God is sent in, the, in his uh, servants, right, to the king. The king is so generous and so benevolent that he's like, I still give you something, right? I still give you something. But there is a difference between the one, the ones who wins and the earn, and earns the trophy, and those given a consolation prize out of compassion and mercy. Right. So there's a, there's a difference between really taking the cup home, right, and, and getting a little uh, what they call those on there? Participation trophies. Yeah, yeah, participation trophies, which is a thing now. Yeah. SubhanAllah. And, and, and for all there will be ranks from what they do. And he may pay them. That that deeds. he may pay them. That he may pay mm -hmm. them for their deeds, and they will not be wrong. Yeah, Allah Azza wa says, Wali kullin darajatum mimma amilu. And he has different levels, right? It's so interesting how even modern slang, right? Actually, uh, people get it. Like they say, there's levels to this thing. Right? Yeah. Allah said, It's different levels. You're not, you're not getting the same. The person who just is going through the motions is not going to get the, the same thing as what the person who's in it with his heart is going to get. And they might be standing right next to each other, praying behind the same man. Right? And that one's Salah. I mean, it, it, it's taking him to Jannah, and the other one's Salah is... Uh, not doing much for him. <coughs> Allah created mankind solely to worship him, and he created everything else to be at mankind's service. It is related in a hadith uh, Qudsi, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala All right, said, stop, stop there. So the, the, the author actually did not call this a hadith Qudsi. He said, fil athar al-ilahi. That's different. So, so a Divine narration, when the scholars use that term, divine narration, al-athar al-ilahi, sometimes what they're referring to, oftentimes what they're referring to is something that has been narrated from Ahlul Kitab, something that has been narrated from the people of the scripture, which is also called what? Anybody know that there's a technical term for that? They're called Israeliyat. Israeliyat. Okay? So the narrations from Israel, okay? Israeliyat. So this here, the, uh, cross out Hadith Qudsi because the, the, there's a big difference between Hadith Qudsi and Athar Ilahi, which is a, better translated as a divine narration. Now, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, O son of Adam, I created you to worship me and created everything else for you. So by my rights upon you, do not indulge in matters other than what I created you for. Okay, all right, stop there. So, I, again, I'm not going to stop everywhere where I think that there's a better translation because that's not really the issue. But sometimes the, the meaning is not coming through. And so it is important that, you know, that we look at that. So here, he says, so by my rights upon you, in Arabic it says, Uh, now, he says, فَبِحَقِّ عَلَيْكْ لَا تَشْتَغِلْ بِمَا خَلَقْتُهُ لَكَ عَمَّا خَلَقْتُهُ أَمَّا خَلَقْتُكَ لَهِ Right. So I would translate, I would, I would, that where it says, do not indulge in matters. No, he says, do not use what I created for you, which is what? The dunya. لا, لا. Do not use what I created for you. Right? I created for you. The dunya. Do not use what I created for you to distract you from what you were created for. You got it? Do not use, do not use what I created for you to distract you from what I created you for. All right? Thank you. Which, which, which again, this is a there, we don't have any evidence that Allah said this uh, is not authentic from the Prophet saying. However, many of the scholars mention that this meaning is authentic, and as well as the 
uh, what's to come, which is also an Israeli narration. Go ahead. In another narration, O son of Adam, I created you to worship me, so do not play. Okay, I so do not play around. Forget the I thing. So do not play around. Like Just like we say, stop playing around, right? So do not play around. Yes. I, I guarantee you your provision in this life, so do not tire, tire yourself. I e seek provision, seek your provision, but but do not make it a concern because provisions are already decreed. All right. So in other words, a lines would in this in this uh, narration, if you will, I, I have taken responsibility of providing for you. So don't exhaust yourself. Right. This is actually. I, I, I mean, the meaning comes out here where it says, um, "Do not tire yourself. Don't exhaust yourself, like to the point that you that you cease to worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. It's affecting your worship. That your risk, seeking your risk, is affecting your ability to worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Don't don't let it get to that point because Allah has has already written that. Now, O son of Adam, whenever you seek me, you shall find me, and whenever you find me, you shall find everything. But if you were to lose me, you would lose everything. Verily, I ought to be the most beloved one to your heart. Yeah, so uh, here, if you find me, you have found everything. And if you lose me, you have lost everything. The, think about the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Hashr. وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهِ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ Don't be like those who forgot Allah. And so then Allah what? Cause them to forget themselves. If you lose a law, you lost everything. Even yourself. Because if you don't recognize in that moment that you are Abdullah, then you lost yourself. You've lost yourself. Right? And then and then as it as it ends, I ought to be the most beloved one to your heart. Uh, Allah says uh, in the Quran, Waladina Amanu, Ashaddu Hubban Lillah. Those who believe are what? More intense in their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Ibn Rajib rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, he says in his book, Fadlu ilm al salafi al khalaf, yani the, the virtue that the, the knowledge of the salaf has over the knowledge of the khalaf, he said that this narration is not found in any of the books of hadith, it's from the Isra'iliyat. And that the meaning is authentic. Play. This is why Allah, Most High, made the salah the means through which people can be near Him, invoke Him, earn His love, and enjoy His company. Nah. Uh, 1.7. Experiencing the detachment from Allah during the intervals between the five daily prayers. The Abd of Allah, or the Abd of Allah, experiences times of heedlessness. Detachment from Allah, hardening of the heart, disregarding mistakes, and disposes towards uh, sinning during the intervals between the five daily prayers. This deplorable, this deplorable change takes him away from his Lord and prevents him from being near to him and alienates him from his position as the true Abd of Allah. Now, Even, so, so here, Ibn al Qayyim. He, he starts this uh, section off, not, not section 1.7, section 1.6, talking about the essence of the salah, right? And that the main idea behind the salah is that you are totally devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, totally present. After the salah was going to happen, naturally, it, you're not going to be in the same state anymore, right? Now, uh, again, through, through doing this, day after day, and then week after week, and month after month, and year after year, you should see a change. Who you were last year should be different than who you were this year, based on, based on that salat, the, the consistency in the salat. But from one slot, salat to another, and there's a, there, there's a time in between, there's a level of uh, uh, slips that people make, sometimes, sometimes uh, deliberate sins that a person commits, which is different from, from a slip. And then sometimes there's just indifference, like just don't feel like doing anything or whatever it might be. All of that begins to create a distance between the slave and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is basically what he's trying, what, what the, the author is saying there. 
All right, so now what? He says even worse? Even worse, he may willingly deliver himself to his enemy, Shaphan, who captures him, puts him in chains, and locks him in the prison of his base desires, causing him to experience nothing but anxiety, grief, sorrow, and regret, while being unaware of the reason behind his wretched condition. Put it, put, put like a line, highlight that, while being unaware of the reason behind his condition. What does he say? Once a person submits to Shaitan, he turns his soul over, right, to his own desires and whims and these type of things, right? Now he's, he's locked up. Now he gets locked up. This is prison because now your desires are controlling you, right? And a person doesn't realize because usually, usually when we think of desires, we think about stuff that that person what? Temporarily enjoys, right? They want that thing. So even though they want it, this is something that they want to do, but then they start, it doesn't do anything for them. So they're not feeling right inside. And maybe they're feeling a little anxious or they're feeling sad about something or they're regretting and they don't realize why am I but it's not making them feel good. Right? So, go ahead. It is through the mercy of his Lord, the most compassionate, who decreed upon him a comprehensive act of worship made up of di uh, diverse phases and formats so when he, when he says phases and formats, uh, literally it's different parts in different situations. And what he's talking about here is standing, bowing, uh, prostrating, sitting, what you might do before the salat, like making will do. So there's different, this act of ibadah is made up of different parts, different situations. Uh -huh. each, each phase and format corresponds to the different actions he committed and conditions he experienced outside the salat. More so, it is, a, it is designed so that, he, so that the goodness and benefit he acquires from each phase is in a, in a measure proportionate to his needs, as this act of worship, i.e. salat, is prescribed to demonstrate his servitude to Allah. All right, so here, what the author is telling us, rahimahullah, is that each part of the salat matches something that is outside of the salat, meaning every, everything you do in the salat uh, is supposed to match or will match something that you've done outside of the salat so that it removes any negative impact that something you did outside the salat had. Okay? Um, and he's going to start with the issue of, of wudu. Okay, now, how, what, what, what does that look like, for example? So, and, and this is what he's going to talk about in a minute. But if outside the salat, somebody does something and they actually have physical uh, dirt that needs to be removed, then how does that go away? Through wudu, right? Also, wudu is, is a ritual form of purity that erases sins, Right? And then there's things you say after we'll do that draws you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All this before the salat. And all of this related to something that has happened outside of the salat, parallel to it. So this is what he's going to talk about now, inshallah ta'ala. This is his prelude to say, to, to, because he wants to talk about each part of the salat. He's trying to show you that Allah has prescribed an act of ibadah that is so comprehensive that there's absolutely nothing else like it, which is why salat is considered to be the greatest Ritual act of worship in Islam. Right. 1.8 Discussion on Wudu. Wudu is the prescribed ritual whereby dirt, dirt and filth are cleansed and removed so Allah's believing slave may stand pure in his presence. The effect of Wudu that manifests itself outwardly is the cleansing of the body and the limbs used in the act of worship, Salah. The inward effect, on the other, on the other hand, is subtle. As it, has, as it has to do with the purification of the heart from its sins through uh, repentance. All right, so stop right there. What effect does wudu have? In order to answer that, we got to say A and B. Right, what effect does wudu have? A? Purifies the heart. It cleanses you. 
so let's go, let's go externally or, or outwardly, right? And then we can say part B is, is internally, inwardly. Like externally, what does we'll do? What does it do? Right, so it, it, it physically removes any dirt that may be on you, all right? And inwardly or internally, what does it do? It, it cleanses the heart. It cleanses the heart through toba. He's going to talk about that now, right? The two aspects of wudu are inscribed in the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, Allah loves those who are consistently repent, repentant and love, uh, loves those who purify themselves. Nah. In the law, you hibbu tawabin, where you hibbu al mutatahirin. So Allah combines between two types of people that He loves here. Who are they? The tawabun. And who are the tawabun? What do they do? Yeah, there is, there's a difference between a ta'ib and a tawab, right? A ta'ib is somebody who does what? Right, so a ta'ib is somebody who has done or is doing tawbah, right? And what is tawbah? Repentance, turn back to Allah. Okay, play it. What's the difference between tawbah and istighfar? Repentance is having the intention to never go back to Right, so, so, so tawbah requires that you have the firm determination never to go back to, to committing that sin. Doesn't mean that you won't do it again. It means that you are firmly, you have firmly made that decision that you're not going to commit that sin ever again. That is required in Toba. And so Toba is to feel that remorse, right? It is to, absence, to stop committing that sin, which also means that if the sin involves somebody else, that you have to, you have to make it right with them. You have to make it right. That, that's a part of stopping, right? And then the last thing is that you have firm determination not to go back to that sin. So toba is an action of the, of the heart. Toba is an action of the heart. Istighfar is dua. It's seeking forgiveness, which is an action of the tongue. And a person may seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, feeling bad about the sin they've committed, but not feeling strong enough to leave off the sin. And so they haven't made toba. Understand the difference? A person might feel bad. They might be addicted to something. Right? They feel bad about it, and they're not ready to give it up. They can still ask Allah for forgiveness, and Allah may forgive them. But that's not toba. That's not toba. Allah says, in the law, you hibbu tawabin, the ones who consistently turn to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, who consistently recognize whatever sins they have committed and who consistently make that firm determination not to go back to committing that sin again. Well, you hibbu al mutatahirin, those who purify themselves. And so there's a relationship between repentance and purification. Now, where he links repentance with purity and the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. O oh Allah, make me among those who turn to you in repentance and make me among those who are purified. Mm -hmm. Where he, wherein he prescribed for us to supplicate to be among the cleansed and among the repentant ones. Tayyip, when does somebody when is somebody supposed to say Allah majani min at tawabin wa jani min at tahirin? After we'll do Tayyip, write this down. Umar ibn Khattab, write it down. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ma minkum min ahadin yatawadda fu yusbigh al wudu. There is not one of you who performs wudu thoroughly. Okay? And then says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Write this down. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Wahdahu la sharika lah. Wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. Tayyib. What did I just uh, read it back to me? Huh? Umar ibn Khattab radiyallahu anhu said, huh? That the Prophet said, what? It's not one of you. Whoever of you performs will do. Any kind of will do? Thoroughly. Perform your wudu thoroughly, right? 
and then says what? Shadun la ilaha illallah. Shadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu illa futihat lahu abwaabu al-jannah al-thamaniyah. Yadkhulu min ayyha shah. Except that the eight gates of Jannah are open for him. He may enter from whichever one he likes. At Tirmidhi, this hadith is Sahih Muslim. Hadith is Sahih Muslim. At Tirmidhi added after the Shahada, Shadu Allah ilaha illallah. Shadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rahduhu la sharika la. Wa shadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu. He added, Allah ma ja'alni min al-tawabin. Wa ja'alni min al-mutatahirin. However, Many of the scholars of hadith say that this, uh, this addition is not authentic. That addition is not authentic. So I just wanted to bring awareness to that. And if a person says that dua every once in a while, that's not a problem at all. There's no issue with that. Why? Because Allah said he loves those people. So you want to be from the people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. In fact, we did a whole 10 weeks on one dua. That Ibn Rajab explained. What was at the end of that dua? Allahumma inni asaluka what? Hubbak. Oh Allah, I ask you what? For your love. Wahubba man yuhibbuk. And to love those who? Whom you love. Wa ish? Wa amalin. Yubalighuni hubbak. And to guide me to actions that allow me to reach your love. Right? Allow me to acquire your love. And so from amongst those actions is what? Tawbah and Tahara. So asking Allah, Allah maj'alni min al-tawabin. Waj'alni min al-mutatahirin. It's a beautiful dua. It's just in terms of it being related to this specific time after wudu, this hadith, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, is not authentic. Clear? All right, alhamdulillah. So can you say that dua? Sometimes, yes. Just don't, don't tie it directly to wudu. And after we'll do, you should make sure that you say every single time, subhanAllah, how many, how many times have we missed out on this? It reminds me of the hadith uh, when Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, radiallahu anhu man, heard about the reward for praying the janazah, right? That there's a qirat, for, for, like, which is like the Mount of Uhud worth of reward for praying the janazah. And Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu man, hadn't heard that hadith before. And so he went and he checked and he verified and then he said, how many kirats have we missed, right? How many times have we missed the Prophet like is just saying here, just say, Shadu la ilaha illallah, wahtahu la sharika la, shadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. After every time you make wudu, if you say that, the eight gates of Jannah are open for you. You can enter from any, any of them you want. Now. Yes. Allah therefore perfected for his believing our degree and layers of purity and servitude to him, inwardly and outwardly at every uh, stratum, uh, bearing witness that there is no ilah worthy of worship except Allah, and that Muhammad is his messenger, purifies him from disbelief and polytheism. Okay, so here, number one, look at the levels of purification through wudu and the dhikr after wudu. Through wudu and the dhikr after wudu. So when you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika. That is what? That is tahara. That's purifying you from kufr and shirk. Tayyip. Then? Yeah. Turning to him in repentance purifies him from sin. So, so when you're asking Allah, Allah maja'alni min at based on that narration being authentic, then that is a purification itself from, from sins. But the wudu itself, by the way, wudu itself purifies from sins. Causes the sins to fall off. No. And using water in wudu purifies him from visible filth. Right. Any phys physical, tangible filth is removed through wudu. Tayyip, keep going. Bismillah. Uh, 1.9. Perfecting one's uh, servitude in attending the masjid. So, so you see how Ibn al is going in order, right? Because normally a person is going to make wudu before they go to, before they go to the masjid. That's the normal... Practice. No. In particular, Allah prescribed that his abd be in the most perfect level of purity wudu prior to entering upon him and standing before him in salah. As only then he does as only then does he ex 
exalted be he, grant permission for his abd to stand in his presence. After he has become pure both from the, from the outside and the inside, thus signifying that he is not a rebellious abd. Okay, so Ibn al-Qayyim is laying this out in terms of the, using the language that would be used for an actual slave. So you have the slave that is fine, like, you know, lives amongst the, the, the family and serves and serves the, the master. And then you have the, the runaway slave, fugitive, right? And so what he's saying here is that the one who purifies himself inside out, preparing himself for the salat, is, make, is signifying to himself first and signifying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm not, I'm not rebellious. I'm preparing myself to be in your presence, right? Now, nah. And when he enters his house, i.e. the masjid, the place where he... Where like, subhanAllah, let me just... I, I just The only way this is going to work, the only way this is going to work, is you really got to feel this stuff. You got to make yourself think about that. Don't, like, put it in your mind right now that the next time you make wudu, you're thinking of yourself as a, as a fugitive slave coming back. All right, I'm, I got to come. I got to get back, right? That's... You're getting that train ticket. You're going back down south. Huh? You went through the Underground Railroad and you said, now nah, I'm going back. Okay? So literally, it's like, I'm going to make this will do. I'm going to make this will do. This is me purifying myself so that I can prepare whatever else I was doing, whatever uh, heedlessness or negligence or indifference or whatever was going on, all that's to the side. Uh, I'm getting myself prepared. Stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oftentimes, because wudu is a ritual, and it's not a bad thing, by the way, we'll, we'll talk about, it's not a bad thing that you become accustomed to ibadah. In fact, that's a good thing. It's a good thing that you say on your tongue. Like if you just sat down and you just said, subhanAllah, 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 and you weren't even thinking about what you were saying. Is that better or being silent is better? That's better. Because eventually, you know what's going to happen? What you're saying on your tongue will have an impact on your heart, eventually. You know, it's better for your heart and your tongue to be in harmony. But remembering Allah Jalla is better than, than not remembering him. And so making will do, even if it's just ritual, right? Even if it's just something you're not really thinking about, that's still better than, than what? Than its opposite, which would be not to make will do. But I'm saying let's try to take this to another level and seek Allah Jalla's aid in that, right? Which, which is the always... Asking Allah at the end of every salah, Allahumma a'inni ala, Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Wa husni ibadatik. Right? You want to get to that level of ihsan in your ibadah. That level of ihsan requires that your heart is present. You should thinking about what you're doing. Now. And when he enters uh, his house, the masjid, the place where he evinces? Yeah. Evinces his servitude to Allah, he becomes one of his slaves. This explains the reason why attending the masjid to pray the compulsory salah in, con in congregation, which some scholars consider obligatory to do and others consider highly recommendable to do, is deemed from the aspect of perfection of, the one, of one's servitude to Allah. The example of a heedless person is like a rebellious abd, disobeying his master. That fugitive slave that ran away. Yeah. He ceases to put his limbs and heart at the service of his master, which is the sole purpose for which he is created. But as soon as he comes back to his master, he effectively nullify, nullifies his state of, of disobedience and restores his state of obedience. And when he stands before him in humility and salah, the compassion and the compassion and kindness of his master overwhelms and engulfs him. And accept him after having reject, rejected him before. Allah Akbar. Play. So here, the author, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he's talking about why it's so important to pray the Fard Salah in congregation, right? Because, it, and he mentioned that some scholars consider it obligatory and others consider it commendable. We're going to talk about that in just a second, inshallah Ta'ala. But it, it's it's from, as he says, is deemed from the aspects of perfection of one's servitude to Allah. And that is because you actually have to go somewhere, right? So now it's not just the tahara and preparation, 
but it's like I'm going to leave this place, my home or whatever place I was comfortable at, and I'm going to go somewhere for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is different than just standing up. And, and everybody feels that. Everybody feels that. Uh, which is why, I mean, you'll, you'll find, for example, that there's some, where is it better for a woman, a woman to pray, by the way? In a house? Huh? Or in a masjid? For tarawih, where is it better for a woman to pray? In a house or in a masjid? Taban Allahu Adam. In her house if she's able. Okay, I, I, I'll do you one better. In the front row here, right? Front row of the message. Is it better to pray in the front row or the second row? Front row? What if it's 10 people in the front row? And you, if you're there the whole time, you like this. The whole time. You, ra- you would rather be, and I didn't ask you what you would rather be. I said, what's better? Second row or the first row? First row? <laughs> Mashallah. There, there is a principle that will help you understand, help you in your ibadah, inshallah ta'ala. That is that the virtue that is directly related to the ibadah itself takes precedence over where the ibadah is performed. Right? So, if in the second row you can actually uh, have some, some space whereby your, your thoughts are on the salat and not on being crushed, then it's better for you to pray in the second row. All right? No, no, this is important. This is important to understand. Don't, however, don't let that uh, get you to the point where, oh, if I go to the masjid, huh, I'm not as comfortable as I am in the house. So I'm going to go ahead and pray in the hot ladder. Don't, don't let shaitan play with you like that. But in the masjid itself, they are different things. So now, let's, but let's go a step further. So it is better for a woman to pray in her home. There's no doubt about that from the Sunnah of the Prophet, who mentioned that the best prayer for the woman is in her home. However, uh, and, and many of the ulama have talked about tarawih specifically, but even for other salawat, if praying in her home does not allow her to uh, achieve a certain level of khushur, for whatever reason that may be, Maybe her ability to recite the Quran is not strong at all. And she feels a lot more comfortable being in the masjid. And she, she's able to feel her salat. Then it's better for her, at, at that, if that's the case, it's better for her to pray in the masjid. Now, obviously, there's other logistical circumstances that will determine that, the, the reality of that or whatever. But I, I, my, my point in mentioning this was that Sometimes people get very focused on the where and not the how of the salat. The, the how is, is more important than, than the where. Now here, and obviously these are general statements. So since we don't have a lot of time left, I want you to write down the evidence. So Ibn al-Qayyim, rahmatullah he says that some scholars hold, hold praying in jama'ah to be obligatory, while others hold it to be commendable. Jama'ah in the masjid. He holds the opinion that salat of jama'ah in the masjid is an obligation upon the men. It is an obligation upon men. And from the evidence that he mentions in another book of his, I'm going to mention it to you now, inshallah ta'ala, is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَإِذَا كُنْتَ فِيهِمْ فَقَمْتَ لَهُمُ الصَّلَاةِ فَلْتَقُمْ طَائِفَةٌ مِّنْهُمْ مَعَكْ وَلْيَأْخُذُوا أَسْلِحَتَهُمْ وَإِذَا سَجِدُوا فَلْيَكُرُوا مَنْ وَرَائِكُمْ وَلْتَأْتِ طَائِفَةٌ أُخْرَى لَمْ يُصَلُّوا فَيُصَلُّوا مَعَكُ To the end of the ayah in Surah An-Nisa, ayah 102. Allah Azza wa Jal says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you are amongst them, right, in the salat, فَقَمْ تَلَهُمُ الصَّلَاةِ And you establish the prayer for them. Let one group of them pray with you. Okay, so this is talking about, obviously, during the time of war. And they're in the time of battle. Let one group of them pray with you while armed. Okay, so that keep, keep your arms. And when they prostrate themselves, let the other group stand guard behind them. And then the group that hasn't prayed yet will then join you in prayer. Let them be vigilant and let them keep their arms as well. All right, so when is this happening? In war. How does this show that Salat and Jama'ah? is an obligation. 
Ibn al-Mundir, rahimahullah ta'ala, one of the great early scholars of Islam, he said in his book Al-Awsat, فَفِي أَمْلِ اللَّهِ بِيْقَامَةِ الْجَمَعَةِ فِي حَالِ الْخَوْفِ دَلِيلٌ عَلَىٰ أَنَّ ذَلِكَ فِي حَالِ الْأَمْنِ أَوْجَبِ He said, Allah Azza wa commanding them to pray in jama'ah, even at the time of fear. They call it Salat al-Khawf, right? Even at the time of fear, they have to pray in jama'ah. He says, then that shows, that is clear evidence that uh, it is even more of an obligation at times of security. Right? Other, I have from the Quran, I'm just going to mention three since we don't have a lot of time. The Prophet ﷺ said, He said, by, by the one in whose hands my soul, I considered uh, having somebody bring me wood. Okay? And then lighting that wood on fire, and then I would command that the salat be established, I mean, that the adam would be called, and then I would tell somebody else to lead the salat. And then I would go to the jalin, to people, right? People's homes, and set their houses on fire. Who said that? The Prophet, the one who was the the most merciful of the people to the people. Allah not sent you except as a mercy to the creation. This is the one who said that. And right? So he's he's saying that by the one in whose hands my soul, if one of them knew that they would find some Material benefit here in the masjid, they would have, they would have come, they would have come and to salat al isha. Right? Obviously, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi did not do it, but the the point here that the scholars mention is that as Sanani said, Rahmatullah al hadith alilun ala wujub al jamati aynan la kifay. This hadith clearly shows that it's an obligation, an individual obligation upon the men, not a communal obligation, because some of the scholars say no, it's just. Salat has to be established. So as long as somebody goes to the masjid and some people pray, then that's fine. It's not, a, it's not an individual obligation. That's hadith that we mentioned, inshallah ta'ala, so we can close it out. And Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala, who said that the Prophet sallallahu wasallam was approached by a blind man. That was Ibn Umm Maktum, by the way. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, inu laysa li qa'id. I don't have anybody that yaquduni in the masjid, somebody that uh, can guide me to the masjid. So he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and salahu fi Now he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, could he give him a concession that he can pray in his house? Mind you, notice here, he asked for a ruqsa. A ruqsa is a concession. You only need a ruqsa when something is what? When something is an obligation. That means that the understanding that the Sahaba themselves had was that you had to pray in the masjid. Clear or not clear? Otherwise, what would he ask the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to give him a ruqsa for it? If it's okay, if anybody can just stay on. No, so he asked for a ruqsa. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave him that uh, concession. When a man was, was turned away, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called him. And he said, Hal tasma'un nida'a lis-salat? Do you hear the adhan? Like where, from where you live? You hear the adhan from the salat? Qala na'am, qala fa'ajib. He said, yes, I hear that thing. He said, the answer to the call. Allah said, what? Hayya ala salah. Hayya ala al-falah. You hear that? You got to come. طيب. This hadith is an authentic hadith. And Ibn al-Mundir, rahimahullah ta'ala, Ibn, Ibn Qudama, Ibn al-Mundir, Ibn Qudama said, وَإِذَا لَمْ يُرَخِّسْ لِلْأَعْمَ الَّذِي لَمْ يَجِدْ قَائِدًا فَغَيْرُهُ أَوْلَى If he didn't give a concession to the one who was blind and who did not have a guide, then how much more so other than that person? Again, as the ulama have mentioned, this is an obligation, liman sami an nida. So whoever hears the adhan. Now we might say, well, I don't hear the adhan, right? Even if the master is next door, you won't hear the adhan. La, la. 
uh, as the scholars have mentioned, that this is how you hear the event without, without noise pollution, right? Which would be, and I'm just, without going through all the measurements, is approximately a mile. So if you live within a mile radius of the masjid, then you, then according to this opinion of the scholars, it is an obligation for you, if you are a man, to pray in the masjid. If you live within a mile of the masjid, because under normal circumstances, you would what? Hear the adhan. You would hear the adhan. If the Prophet ﷺ did not give a concession to Ibn Umm Maktoum, who was blind, then other than him, has more of a right not to have a not to have a concession. We ask Allah for his tawfiq. We ask him to make us amongst his righteous servants. Subhanakallah wa bihamdika shahadu wa la ilaha illa anta